Kia ora everyone, welcome back. Now we have Tim McNamara. Tim learned to code with assist, uh, to assist with humanitarian disasters around the world from New Zealand. He's been tinkering with computers ever since. His area of pro professional expertise is in natural language processing and machine learning. Tim's also the author of Rust in Action, an introduction to Rust for programmers who have never used a systems programming language. Tim, please take it away. Hey, thanks everyone. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. No mai, haere mai, ko Tim McNamara toka inoa. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a full-time Rust developer here in Wellington, uh, and as Nigel introduced, a, I'm actually in the AI side, so I'm very much in the back end. And so it's, uh, it's actually wonderful to be part of a f the front-end community, just, a, just as, a, as a little bit of a, a spy, because you're all so nice. <laughs> uh, I, I've written a book, uh, I organize the local Rust meetup, uh, and I teach programming on YouTube and, and Twitch also. Uh, so just a very small shout out to the local Tangata Whindua of uh, this part of uh, Tu Upoku Itaika, uh, Te, uh, te, uh, te Arawa, uh, as well as my employer, TCDI. Uh, they are a technology company masquerading as a legal services provider based in the east coast of the United States. This is a personal talk, but uh, without them, I wouldn't be here. And just so if you feel like catching me, go contacting, it's Tim Click. Tim Clicks is the easiest way to do it. Uh, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. And there's just a little love heart. Okay, so about the talk. So we're gonna be doing two things today. One is I just want to give you enough knowledge to learn the rest. I'm not going to be able to give you everything there is to know about WebAssembly, that has a technology that's been around for about six years in uh, the next 25 minutes or so. But I do want to provide you with a little bit more than the how-to, oh, sorry, than the, than the front page of the website. I want to explain what it is, also how it works. You might have encountered a couple of really aspirational things about how it's perfectly safe and uh, it's impossible to break and it's really fast. And I want to actually unpack some of those claims and describe how it is that WebAssembly implements those promises that it makes. Uh, we've got three main topic, uh, three main sections of the talk. Um, what it is, uh, where does it fit, and you know, AKA, should we try it out at work? And also, how does it work? Um, there will be demos in the talk, and I please forgive me if I if they break, uh, that, because it's a talk. I just had to put that disclaimer out there. So, uh, first question is like, when you go to WebAssembly.org, you will get this description. WebAssembly, abbreviated WASM, is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. WASM is designed as a portable compilation target for programming languages enabling deployment to the web for client and server applications. What? <laughs> so uh, that is not the introduction that I think that we should have up on that web page. For me, or at least the way that I understand it, WebAssembly is a way to build fast and secure code that requires a runtime, like a browser or node, to execute. That's, that's, that's kind of the way that I've understood it. <laughs> Sadly though, from like a comprehension, especially as like a vinegar, it's neither web nor assembly. Uh, so that's cool. Um, uh, uh, the compilation target, like the unit of WASM is a module and our code packages, right? On the web, your runtime is the browser. And uh, on the server, it could be Node, it could be Dino, or when there are dedicated runtimes, and the one that I like the most is called WASM time. So uh, we're going to be looking at the text version of a, Wa a WASM module. Uh, so that's the what file. Converting that to WASM, and then running it on the web browser on localhost. Uh, right, so we're gonna, the text version is up the top. We've got one function that we export, this thing called double. Double takes a single parameter, a float32, so if, uh, a float, and returns a float. That local.get0, this is where kind of the assembly stuff comes in. Local get zero is get the first argument, put that on the stack, get the, the first argument again, and then add those two together, and then return that value. And index.html, that is the, this is all we need to go and uh, take that WASM file and inject it into our web, uh, our web, like into our web page. 
you kind of get this relatively horrible syntax of WebAssembly initiate, uh, instantiate streaming, which says, please start a streaming request, like an asynchronous uh, version. There's a, there's a synchronous API as well. Fetch is um, just go fetch this resource. And in our case, it's um, on the same domain. And then just print to the log the double of 10. So what we want to see, if this works, is 20 come up on the log. That's all we're going to do. So let's, let's try it out. So to do this, we need a tool which is going to be able to convert that text file, that lispy thing, into WASM for us. And so this is called what to WASM. And we do that by installing Wabbit. Right. So, sorry. Um, this actually does get a lot easier. Um, but once you've got Wabbit, it's really, really simple. So the commands that we're going to be taking, we're going to be catting or echoing our Lisp into double dot what, and then we're going to be converting that into a WASM file, and then we're going to be creating our web page and then rendering it. Uh, just as a very kind of like uh, an annoying, particular, annoying component about the API is that it must be uh, provided as application slash wasm in its mime type rather than as plain text. Otherwise, the web browser will reject it as WebAssembly. OK, so let's do it live. OK, so it's, I'm kind of cheating. Um, these are actually, so we've got nothing that's called double currently. So we're going to be, uh, this is kind of semi scripted. Uh, <laughs> um, but these are actually live um, things happening on my file system right now. This isn't, uh, this isn't a video. Um, so now we have two files. Uh, next thing we wanted to say, we're going to create the web page. So we've got this da -da 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 instantiate streaming gobbledygook. That's all good. Now we've got an HTML file. Uh, serve, so I've just got a little, um, little, little server. And I actually need to go to loc. Oh, I cheated. Sorry. Um, actually, no, that wasn't a cheat because before I started the um, uh, before I started the talk, I went and checked that that wasn't working. So we see twenty. <laughs> Hooray! You don't see twenty. <laughs> I see twenty. Uh, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, I can, if you want me to, I can run it again. Sorry. Okay, cool. Uh, OK, just for, ver just for fun, if you really like the list before, we can just kind of hit some more with you as well. This is what it means by assembly. So this is kind of the compiled stuff inside your WASM. Uh, in this case, we're implementing the factorial function. Uh, we get the first argument. We load up a constant. And then we compare them. And if the, the, our, our first argument is less, then return the constant one. Uh, that's the factorial. Otherwise. Uh, recurse back. You can see that we're oh, we're loading those things again, and then we have this call dollar sign fac, um, and then we're multiplying the result. So that's um, it. Only gets more complicated from there, and this is the last time we're going to be seeing Lisp, I think, in the talk. But I wanted you to say that like WebAssembly is just code, and the difference between WebAssembly in the browser versus JavaScript in the browser is that there is no extra runtime. Things run at native speed. But uh, you are in like this barren wasteland of a computing environment if you, are, if you are a WASM module. You have no access to the DOM. You have no access to the rest of JavaScript. All you have are those named methods right at the front. The only thing that you can do is what you've been told that you're allowed to do. So that's the only compute that you can ever, you can do factorial so many times and you're going to be so happy about it, but it's the only thing that you're going to be able to do. <laughs> um, just to give kind of a bit of more of a visual view about what that, what that looks like, JavaScript can kind of introspect WASM's memory. It actually has access both read and write to the WASM memory. We call it the linear memory because we are complicated and we like jargon. Uh, but WASM actually has very limited ability to call uh, to access JavaScript and even less access to the DOM. And so from WASM, you can actually call web APIs that are provided by the runtime or by, the, in this case, the web browser. Uh, but you're not actually just be able to, you're not able to poke around and modify things, which is great for security. OK, and now, but, but we're not actually restricted to the web. We can run a WebAssembly module on the server. 
Uh, now, the difference between running like a Node module, like a, a JavaScript file on the server in Node is really, uh, JS memory kind of doesn't really exist. <coughs> actually, so the, actually ignore the top two lines. The real important part are the bottom two lines in terms of the security context. A JavaScript file is able to do whatever Node is allowed to do. It can pro be promiscuous. All of your dependencies are a security risk, and all of their dependencies are a security risk. With WebAssembly, they have no access to the file system. They can only execute the code that has been predefined. And your node process will only, uh, will only actually execute the command, uh, ex execute WebAssembly if it is guaranteed to be valid. The, the semantics are such that it will just completely reject the entire form, the file if one little bit of it is kind of weirdly misconfigured. Uh, right, well done, you've got to the part two, perfect. Um, so where are we going to find WebAssembly uh, on the web, I suppose? Um, in the server, embedded devices, it is a very, very easy thing to kind of embed uh, and allow external, um, uh, external packages to kind of be run inside um, your little device. And uh, mobile, I'm actually, I'm just having a go, I've maybe got a question right there. Um, because I had a hunt just beforehand, and um, maybe I've exaggerated claims there, but um, I'm sure it does exist. Okay, so WebAssembly can be a really good uh, fit for the front end. Um, One Password has completely sped up their browser plugin by re-implementing it in, in WebAssembly, and also providing all of their cryptographic functions and kind of their, their signing and so forth in WebAssembly. It runs at native speed. It doesn't require an interpreted runtime like a JavaScript engine. Ubric Origin does the same thing. Um, we can see that kind of anecdotally, there is a quote from a, a just an indie games developer who's saying that, you know, my, I've got, I had this little 8-bit emulator that ran on the web, and uh, when I converted over to Wasm, I just got, it, it went faster, and that's all, I, that's all I cared about. eBay played around with it to write a barcode reader in the web, and see that their JavaScript version or their fallback just wasn't performing well enough. Uh, and in fact, the majority of users who tried to use this feature, uh, the thing was timing out for them. Whereas with WebAssembly, that was not the case. You can actually compile native libraries into the web. This was actually the original use case. So at IKEA, they had this optical character recognition uh, and they wanted to include it in uh, just a little baby toy web app, and uh, it worked really well. I know that's a kind of a rubbish way to say that this should be up on the slide, but I thought it was nice seeing a big company experimenting and uh, finding that their proof of concept worked. Uh, if you compare the like-for-like -like, um, performance of a decompressor, an in-browser decompression, um, the WASM version of the NPM package is seven times faster than um, the equivalent PACO package. Now, there is a caveat there, and I'll raise it now rather than right at the end, and that's inside Firefox. So Chromium-based browsers, their WebAssembly support isn't quite as mature. WebAssembly was like, came from Mozilla, and Firefox is heavily optimized for that use case. Um, I'm sure that Chromium-based browsers will, will come, um, but the biggest performance boosts um, come from Firefox. And the other thing is uh, WebAssembly can be make the web a viable target to deploy to. So Figma is an, a web app that you probably have used if you're a front-end, um, if you're inside the UX space. They, um, it's built with WebAssembly. Uh, a relatively new company, this thing called the Uno platform, is one of these providers that promises to enable you to write a single code base which they can compile to multiple places. And for example, the Unity, the game engine, will compile to the web via WebAssembly. Um, so let's, let's run another demo. Uh, we want to be able to provide, this time we're going to be trying, like have a little bit of a view about what it is like to use a server-side language in the front end. So we're actually going to be writing Rust. <laughs> you didn't know you were coming to a Rust talk. Um, 
And I'm going to be demonstrating the, the workflow of uh, passing values between JavaScript and WASM. So we're going to need two tools. One is called Cargo. That's part of the Rust tool chain. And this other thing called WASM pack, which compiles Rust and bundles things together into something that a, looks a lot like a node package. Uh, so these are the instructions. We clone a repository and walk into it, call WASM pack build, which will bundle that up. Then we're going to go into the web directory, run npm install and start. OK, now this is one of the demos that didn't quite work as neatly as it should. So um, bear with me. So this is actually like we're legit cloning right now. This is not recorded. Um, I've just cloned the repository, had an inspection. There's a couple of directories. The one on the right is www, where the uh, web assets live, and src is where the Rust code is. Whereas in pack, we are um, compiling the Rust. Um, I've already pre-downloaded all of its dependencies, so this is going to be relatively quick. <laughs> and then I will end up with, um, with a little file um, slash package, so that's great. Now, it's, giving, it's doing it in a comment here because um, I need to break the fourth wheel and um, actually create, oh, oops, create a new one of these because it won't work. Um, for some reason, the, uh, oh, so I'm in here, npm install doesn't like doing it in my little play demo -y thing. So I'm running npm install. Uh, it's going to be downloading like close to 600 dependencies, and we're going to get lots of security warnings. And then I remember why I really don't like the front end. Because <laughs> um, it's a scary place. Um, OK, thanks, JavaScript. Great. So now we're going to be So now we're going to serve it. Oh, is that right? OK, thank you. Oh, gosh. Uh, standby caller. Start. Come on, team, it was start. <laughs> uh, so if this works, we're going to see the game of life. Should I push refresh? Dun, dun, dun. Yay! <laughs> Great, so what the heck was that? Um, I'm just going to just very briefly uh, just kind of demonstrate that we. Uh, so this is like Rust code. It's, it's pretty hairy, um, but the, I just want to demonstrate this is, this is true. This is an actual thing that we did. So well done. We, we successfully got that to work. Right. Perfect use cases for WASM include uh, operations where you're actually taking one input, applying some transformation, and then pumping that back out. If you are a U block, or U block origin, that is, you're analyzing a string, checking to see whether it matches a known um, list of block domains, that's a great use case for WASM. If you are doing decompression, or you're generating PDFs, uh, like thumbnails, or you're uh, performing some analysis over some kind of arbitrary data, WASM is going to be really great for you. If you need to do massive, lots and lots of interaction between JavaScript or manipulation of um, JS objects inside the WASM one time, your life is going to be, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, the WASM does not have access to JavaScript. So you can think of it almost like it needs to, JavaScript needs to serialize the object into a string that needs to be deserialized inside WASM, and then the analysis needs to go back, right? That's not where you want to play. It's a really good, uh, good fit on the back end when you want to protect your application. Now, left pad should not be able to read from a socket. Like, you should not have any of your, none of your dependencies need to be able to open files unless you want them to open files for you. Uh, I thought that would get one laugh. <laughs> Like on the JavaScript conference, I'm making the left pad joke. Is that too soon? Like, <laughs> um, we want to securely, uh, if you ever want to securely process uh, data that comes in from your users, basically, 
So for example, a previous couple of jobs, I have had things where we will shell out to FMPEG to transcode some audio data. Or I want to shell out to something else, like Image Magic, to uh, provide some post-processing. Fun fact, those programs are not secure. Uh, if your users submit you some like horrible file that manages to break image magic or FMPEG and create a seg fault, then suddenly your attacker has access to all of your servers and every server, oh sorry, your, all that, that host and every server that it is connected to. These days, no one wants to be the next Waikato DHB. Don't, al like, don't allow security holes into your application if they're easily avoidable. And in this case, they are very easy to avoid. You might say, oh, we can just put it in Docker. We'll just put it in Docker. That's fine. <laughs> the problem with just putting it in Docker is that A, you can break out of the container, but more importantly, Docker is opt out of the permissions. So by default, you're not gonna stop people from like inspecting uh, like pinging other servers inside, lo uh, inside the network. The, whereas in WASM, all of the external access is opt-in. It must be defined uh, at compile time. The other one is that if you have, if you want to play with serverless, WASM is a really good way to do so. And you've got your horrible C-sharp app, but there's one component, and you're like, I've heard that you can compile C-sharp to WASM. We can get on the edge. We can be serverless. You absolutely can. Uh, and then your C Sharp application becomes uh, uh, deployable uh, into, say, you know, there are several providers which will take a WASM file and it has a well known endpoint that it will run whenever it's executed. And you only pay by the millisecond. Here's my pitch for Rust, though. If you have something like a C Sharp or a Java or a Go that is compiling to WebAssembly, that compiler needs to bundle in the GC and bundle in the runtime as, along with your application. That means that your WebAssembly modules are going to be large and they will be somewhat more slow than if you could use a language that's designed to be bare metal. And so I would just put that out there. That, um, but let's kind of explore the space. Of like, what does it mean to be on the back end? Um, Got another little demo here, where we are going to add, uh, we're gonna be running a Rust executable and uh, running it in, uh, on the back end. So I've got, I got my little uh, application, I've got a new, um, it's, it's hello world, I'll go into it, oh, and I'm saying, oh look, you need to go and do this yourself. Okay, so I'll go and do that. Um, this is my other one. Dun, 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 CD demo server side. Um, Uh, and then I was just uh, what do we write? Um, uh, NZ JSON. Okay, so that should, <laughs> he says, work. Uh, so now we need to compile it, cargo build, and then we want to target WASI. So WASI is the system interface. We we'll do that, it takes half a second. And we got a bunch of random craft, but the one thing that I want to point out is the, the stuff in green, which is um, the WASM files. And I can come, I'm just gonna move it into where I'm out of target, so, and then I can run, do you remember I mentioned WASM time earlier on? A WASM time is kind of like Node, um, kind of. It will take a WASM file and run it. And then we go. We went, woo! So that's, what it, that's how scary it is to take a, WASM, uh, takes a service size language and then compile it to WASM and run it. That's, that's, it's not scary at all, it's just different. So again, if I could go back to the very aims of the talk, this talk is not gonna be able to teach you everything there is to know about WASM. But I wanna implore you to take a deeper look because it is very, very good technology. Okay, so how does it actually work? Uh, how does it achieve its speed, portability, and safety objectives? First of all, inside, this is kind of technical mumbo jumbo. So if you're, uh, there are no CPU registers inside a WebAssembly module. 
That is, there will be no specter attacks. The virtual machine does, uh, doesn't use them. Uh, there is no go-to, there are no pointers, which means that arbitrary memory, if you've ever looked into how these security exploits actually work, it turns out you can use arbitrary memory as executable uh, in a normal assembly, like normal x86, whereas on this side, um, that cannot happen. Uh, why is it portable? It's a fully described abstract machine. What that, that means is we can do things like completely valid, validate before we've executed any code inside the module, we can validate that it's correct. And it only asks, uh, and the other thing is like, well, how is it so fast? <laughs> and the like, pithy answer is, well, there's actually not that much to do. We, <laughs> we've got all these assembly things like add and so forth. Um, and that's, it can just, the runtime can just map those to native instructions. Uh, but, yeah, uh, the, the, the point about there is an opt-in GC if you're using a managed language and an opt-in VM, for example, as well. And then there's also, uh, so um, just to kind of answer some very uh, possible questions, um, does WebAssembly enable you to avoid JavaScript? <laughs> Um, probably, almost certainly not, actually. Um, but you can, there are attempts uh, to basically run, like compile Ruby to WebAssembly. It works, but you get the baggage of the whole Java, uh, Ruby interpreter. Um, is we, is, um, this is the wrong question. The question should be, is, we, is a WebAssembly runtime like the CLR or the JVM? And the answer is, from the point of view of where you're sitting right now, as someone who's using it? Yeah, it's a close enough assumption. I mean, from a technical standpoint, they're completely different. <laughs> but um, as far as, it's just something that sits alongside your application and, get, and does its work for it. And why is WebAssembly allowed, has, why has WebAssembly worked, whereas Flash and before that Java applets failed? Well, think about the defaults that I have focused on a few times. WebAssembly is all opt-in, whereas those other technologies were all opt-out they gave you direct access to the, uh, to the browser's memory address space, which means that any error in your, uh, if, you, if your application was exploitable, the whole browser was exploitable, which meant the whole host was exploitable. Um, you'll encounter this term, of, uh, this bit of jargon. I'm gonna skip that because other people have been clapping. And the, other, the last question is that WebAssembly is associated with C, C++, and Rust. Like, is that valid? Um, I would say not. Do not be afraid of WASM because you are not a C++ developer. Uh, we've already mentioned the overhead um, that comes along with um, using other technologies. So just bonus level, um, I'm part of a team to extend Postgres with uh, Rust. So you can write Rust extensions sorry, Postgres extensions in Rust, and what we are also going to enable is um, extending Postgres with WASM modules. So you'll be able to run all of your processing inside the database um, next to your data. And if you'd like to be part of that, contact me on Twitter or um, go to ZomboDB um, on the GitHub. Uh, cool. So, protect your application from itself and its dependencies. Use WASM modules or protect your users from your application to build WASM modules. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>